So finishing off with the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, although Lenin hoped that the revolution be over in time to make a spectacular announcement at the start of the second All-Russia Congress of so Soviets in the late afternoon of October 25th, events transpired differently. The Congress and delegates were forced to wait for several hours as Bolshevik forces tried to remove the provisional government from the Winter Palace. Lenin became increasingly agitated and embarrassed by the delay. Late in the evening, the Congress was declared open, even though the Winter Palace had still not been taken. Furthermore, despite the Bolshevik leader's efforts, dedicated Bolsheviks constituted only about half of the 650 delegates at the Congress. Lively debate and disagreement took place both about the Bolshevik-led coup and also about who should now lead Russia. The meeting lasted the rest of the night, adjourning after 5 a.m. on October 26th. The Congress resumed once more late the next evening, and several important decisions were made during this session. The first motion approved was Lenin's decree on peace, which declared Russia's wish for World War I to end, but did not go so far as to declare a ceasefire. The next matter to be passed was the decree on land, which officially socialized all land in the country for redistribution to peasant communes. Finally, a new provisional government was formed to replace the old one until the Constitution uh, Constituent Assembly met in November as scheduled. The new government was called the Soviet of the People's Com Commissars, SPC. Lenin was its chairman. All the members were Bolsheviks. As defined by the Congress, the SPC uh, had to answer to a newly elected executive committee chaired by Lev Kamenev, who in turn would answer to the Constituent Assembly. So lots of shenanigans were going on during there, but it seems like actually with all the revolutions, the actual um, it's just a storm, right? We're just going to storm. We're going to take over the land. We're going to take over the buildings. We're just going to take over with people, and then that's how we win by the military force of the victory, right? Of domination, the might is right doctrine. Um, right. So that's what they did with the uh, Winter Palace. Eventually, they just stormed and they took over. And uh, that's uh, also how they did with the uh, the Glorious Revolution of England. The Glorious Revolution was just uh, the, the guy just, uh, King James just stepped down. And then uh, William of Orange was convinced to stay. There's a 1963 Hadern coup d'etat. Because um, so we've seen with Cuba, we saw that the Americans were antagonists in Cuba and in the Haitian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution. And... Um, really a lot of revolutions we see them as either being neutral and saying we don't want to be a part of that like in the French Revolution or flat out being for the uh, dictators and um, and so the Honduran coup d'etat recent one is actually an instructive example that happened five years ago but let's go to 1963 to the Honduran coup d'etat as a military takeover of the Honduran government October 3rd 1963 ten days before a scheduled election so there's gonna be an election but then there's a coup d'etat um, Arellano replaced Ramon Vieda Morales as the president of the country initiated two decades of military rule. And this is something America did, okay? So it was one of the most violent coups in Central American history. We did the same thing to Guatemala. We did the same thing to Nicaragua and El Salvador and Chile. We've also meddled in Colombia affairs and um, we tried a, a coup d'etat against uh, Hugo Chavez. Honduras in 2009, and then I think there was something in 2010. There's um, Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, points this out, but we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, so the 1963 Honduran coup d'etat. The coup d'etat happened in Honduras right before the scheduled election, 10 days before the election. Um, Morales had instituted progressive labor laws and agrarian reform policy, which prompted accusations of communist sympathies from the right wing in Honduras and the United States. His intention to expropriate land from the United Fruit Company. Same reason that we had the Iran Contra scandal, the same reason you had, um, you know, Nicaragua. We were supporting the dictators against these revolutionary fighters because of the United Fruit Company, you know, Chiquita Banana. It was never carried out, but it was a particular source of friction. Civil military relations in Honduras had deteriorated since 1957. A coup attempt in 1959, suppressed by students and unionist supporters of Morales, provoked intense hostility towards the military and the creation of an autonomous presidential guard. Politicians discussed abolishing the military. Um, Alvarado, the Liberal Party's candidate for president, ran on a demilitarization platform, was expected to win the election on October 13th. The military acted preemptively and seize control of the government. So, right before an election, because we're going to do this again, okay, so this is the United States' involvement in Latin America, our backyard, our so-called backyard. 
Um, there's a, an election that's coming 10 days, 1963 in October. And the person who's going to win was wanting to get rid of the military and not have it by military decree. They was going to have, you know, a civilian-run government in Honduras. So it was going to be peaceful. It was going to be better. It was going to be good. Um, but the military got scared. And just like in Egypt, they got scared and they grabbed a hold of power. And then they brought in two decades of military rule. So that's what, the, Egypt looks bad right now. Egypt looks really bad. They started out with a good revolution. Tunisia is a good success, uh, a recent success story for revolutions. Tunisia. But um, Egypt looks really bad because the military has come back. So that's what the Honduran coup d'etat was about. In defense of the United Fruit Company, which is an American corporation, probably financed by America. Um, you had this coup d'etat that had happened. So you have a coup d'etat that happened in Honduras in 2009. Um, this occurred when the Honduran army, on orders from the Honduran Supreme Court, ousted President Manuel uh, Zelaya. So Z Zelaya. And sent him into exile June 28, 2009. as prompted by the violation of the Constitution through attempts to schedule a non-bonding poll and holding a referendum about convening a constituent assembly to rewrite the Constitution. So again, constitutional revolution. This is going to be a revolutionary change. The demilitarization of the 1963 uh, president, you know, candidate elect was going to be a revolution, a electoral revolution. This is a constitutional revolution. But they stopped it. They said that the Supreme Court, they give orders to the army to oust President Manuel Zelaya. And immediately, we have a crisis in Latin America that you hadn't seen before, okay? Hugo Chavez is pretty strong. And so they had kicked Honduras out, and they said we didn't recognize. And so the whole world actually condemned this coup d'etat. Even um, United States, I think, uh, Obama says that he recognizes that it's an illegal coup d'etat. So he made public comments to the, you know, um, to, to that case, being that, that being the case. So after Zelaya... Uh, Zelaya refused to comply with court orders to cease the Honduran uh, Supreme Court secretly issued a warrant for his arrest on June 26. Two days later, Honduran soldiers stormed the president's house. In the middle of the night, detained Zelaya for stalling the poll. Instead of bringing him to trial, they put him in a military airplane, which flew him to Costa Rica. So they kidnapped him and told him to go. They did the same thing to Aristide. Basically, they just showed up and said, hey, you need to get on this ship. And then they sent him to South Africa. So they, they just storm the thing, they catch him with basically their pants down, right? And then once they're surrounded, they say, you have to do what we tell you, or else. And so they, they don't have to say the or else part, right? They have people with guns everywhere. Look at your position. What are you going to do? And so Aristide got on the plane and he left. Same thing with Z, Ziala. He goes to, or Z, Zilaya. So it was a coup d'etat because they kidnapped him and sent him to exile. But they did not execute him. So, it's a bloodless coup d'etat. By force, but nobody died. Voted to remove Zelaya from office after reading a false resignation letter. And then they appointed a constitutional successor, Speaker of Congress Roberto Micheletti, in his place. International reaction to the 2009 Honduran coup d'etat was marked by widespread condemnation of the events. The United Nations, the Organization of American States, the European Union condemned the removal of the Laia is a military coup on November 5th. The OAS invoked for the first time Article 21 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter voted by the acclamation of all member states to suspend Honduras from the organization. Um, America didn't suspend. They kept giving payments and paying money to the Honduran government. So this either went along with American permission or we were actually financing it. In July 2011, Honduras's Truth Commission concluded that Zelaya broke the law when he disregarded the Supreme Court ruling, ordering him to cancel the referendum. But again, it was a non-binding vote. Non-binding vote for a referendum, for a constitutional convention, that should be allowed. Uh, it was his removal from office was illegal in the coup. So they said that he did wrong, but they shouldn't have been um, removed from office. A designation of Congress by Roberto Micheletti as interim president was ruled by the commission as unconstitutional and as administration as a de facto regime. So how it happened, soldiers stormed the president's residence in Chugelo Galpa, Chuguchi Galpa, 
um, early in the morning, and this is in Latin America. Honduras is a big country right in Latin America, not all the way down by Panama, but sort of by Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, and or, uh, um, Nicaragua, and um, the other country that I always forget. El Salvador, Nicaragua, and somebody else, I don't know. But it's in Latin America, right? Okay, so it was a fast operation. It was over in minutes. There were no injuries, no deaths. Um, they disarmed the presidential guard, wakened the Laya, put him in a plane to Costa Rica. They found him in his um, pajamas. They said, we have a judicial order to retain you in Costa Rica. The Laya told the Pan Latin American channel, tell us, sir, that he'd been awakened by gunshots, masked soldiers, took his cell phone, shoved him into a van, took him to an Air Force base where he was put on a plane. He said he did not know he was being taken to Costa Rica until he landed at the airport in San Jose. Why Costa Rica? Why there? You know, who did this? The Supreme Court ordered him to go to Costa Rica. Within several hours of his removal, Zelaya spoke to the media in San Jose, calling the events a coup, a kidnapping, and stated that the soldiers pulled him from his bed, assaulted his guards. Zelaya stated he would not recognize anyone named as his successor. He'd be meeting with diplomats. And he wanted to finish his term in office. So this this sounds this this stinks of uh, America all over. We did the same thing with Aristide, right? We we stopped right in front of him, said we're going to send you to South Africa. The same thing with uh, Chile. We stormed his palace, and they said he killed himself, right? Which is interesting that they didn't go that route with this. I bet they're probably kicking themselves later on because the whole world knew what had happened, uh, and so the Latin America countries they all. The stronger reactions, okay, President Barack Obama, he says, we believe that the coup was not legal and that President Zelaya remains the president of Honduras. So that's the United States public comments. Amongst stronger reactions, the president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, pledged to bring down any replacement government. So <laughs> any government that replaces Zelaya will be replaced, right? So Hugo Chavez was basically taken, taken over. America's based uh, international organizations such as the Organization of American States, Mercosur, and the Bolivia, uh, Bolivarian Alternative for the Americas also condemned the events. No foreign government recognized the de facto president, Roberto Micheletti. Uh, the president Morales, his remarks, Evo Morales, he says um, he alleged U.S. involvement in coup attempts or political upheaval in Venezuela in 2002, which Hugo Chavez also says that um, they were involved in 2002. They were involved with Aristide, right? This is George W. Bush. So, yes, there's a coup d'etat with Aristide. There was an attempted one in Venezuela and then Honduras. We're seeing the same thing in 2009. And in Ecuador, he mentions Ecuador, which is interesting, in 2010. So I'm not for sure what happened in Ecuador. But, but all these cases, Ecuador 2010 and um, the Venezuela in 2002, right? Why, what, what are we doing? Why is our government overthrowing other governments? Why are we involved in this type of behavior? Because we're an empire? Because we uh, don't like the ideas of communism? The idea is we should only be invading people that are hurting others, okay? We should not be terrified of ideas. You're a big elephant terrified of a little mouse who says... Peace, land, and bread. Peace, land, and bread. Ah! I'm so scared. So I'm going to check out Ecuador 2010 and Venezuela 2002. Um, but the Empire of the United States says one in Honduras. Morales says a reference to the allegations of former Honduran President Zelaya that the U.S. was behind the ouster. People of the Americas in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, we won. Morales continued, we are three to one with the United States. Let's see what the future brings. So he was saying in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, we won, but we lost in um, Honduras. So he admits that there is, you know, something went bad or went wrong. Um, it's certainly true that critics have produced no clear evidence of U.S. involvement in any of these cases. If your standard for clear evidence of U.S. involvement is a U.S. government document dictated in advance, everything that subsequently happened, but this would be like saying the critics have produced no clear evidence for the Armenian genocide because researchers haven't yet found a Turkish mine comp. There's no proof of a plan. How do we know that the Armenian genocide even happened? Right. The, uh, in Latin America, the coup in Honduras is widely understood to be a test case for U.S. policy towards Latin America by attacking the weakest and most vulnerable of the ALBA countries. The U.S. hoped to strike a blow to this alternative economic bloc, which the U.S. counts as an enemy. 
However, in the wake of the coup, the U.S. found itself in a historically unprecedented position at the OAS, viewed by Latin America governments from both the right and the left as a potential direct threat to each of them. The OAS took a unanimous position, denouncing the coup and rejecting Honduras from the OAS. Uh, the OAS. The U.S. was forced to accept this decision. This decisions. So, Hugo Chavez. Let's check out who this man is, okay? And then I'm gonna get to um, sort of a weird. Uh, well, let's go. We'll figure it out.